Hey, it's Riley, and I'm gonna show you today how to make this optimized game-ready asset starting from a scan I did on my phone. Everything from the sculpting and the texture painting and the procedural textures was all done within Blender, so we never left Blender, which is really great if you're like me and you're on an indie production budget and you don't have a big studio paying for your software. So if that interests you, stick around because I'm about to show you every single step. First to scan, I'm using an app called Polycam. Polycam is the best. Use your phone on the go or grab your camera because with Polycam, you can upload images either mobile or from the comfort of your computer. I don't really use the LiDAR functionality. I find photo scanning to yield the best results for items like this. I found this cool looking totem pole in a store I was in over the weekend with my family. So I set it up away from the wall a bit and walked around it three or four times. I actually just used video mode, so I didn't even have to tap the screen to take photos. Just walk slowly and don't neglect spots such as the underside of the bird's beak or the back. If you don't get it on camera, there's no way it'll be captured. But this is what I'm calling a garbage scan. Basically, just a reference scan as a starting point, so I'm not too worried about things like the lighting or anything like that. Export from Polycam as an OBJ and import into Blender. I like to use cubes to cut away any excess geometry I don't like in the scene. Bool Tool is an add-on that comes with Blender and speeds up the Boolean modifier workflow. Once you have a nice clean model, you might want to go back into the object data properties and clear custom split normal data. That can leave you with some strange normal issues. On to a quick sculpt. I like to duplicate the original object so we can use it as visual reference. On the new one, I fill out the bottom with Alt-F, then within the object data properties again, we can run a voxel remesh operation. Play around with the voxel size. Obviously, this is heavily affected by the scale of your object, so just play around with the number. Okay, here's a situation you might run into where you're using the voxel remesher and you get this weird issue where your mesh is just full of these holes and it doesn't seem to be filling in quite properly. So I wanted to show a quick solution for that. Just go back into sculpt mode and go to your tool properties and scroll down until you see something called Dyne Topo. This stands for dynamic topology and if you enable it temporarily, it should fix our issue. Just go to your resolution and again, this is dependent on the scale of your object. Go down to detailing and set it to constant detail. This will reveal a button called Detail Flood Fill. When you click that, it's similar to the voxel remesher, but it shouldn't have the same issue. Now that we've done that, we can go ahead and disable Dyne Topo and go back to the voxel remesher and try it again. Um, then that should fix the issue. If you end up with issues still, just leave it in the comments and I'll see if I can troubleshoot. But that should handle things that most of you might run into. This isn't a sculpting course, it's a workflow overview, but I pretty much just use three, maybe four brushes. Draw sharp to get in my landmark areas, clay strips to add volume where I needed it, and finally smooth and scrape to even things out and give it this kind of carved wood quality as if we're scraping away the actual wood to reveal flat planes. Remember, this is artwork, so it's work, and there's not really a magic button that just makes it happen. I'd say I sculpted for about 45 minutes, just really hacked at it kind of quick, and I'm not gonna show the whole process because, again, this isn't a sculpting course, but I hope you get the idea for some of the tools that I used, and I'm by no means an amazing sculptor, but I love this process because it takes something that belongs to someone else and all of these little mistakes that I make and the decisions I make end up making this thing really my own creation. Next up is the actual texture painting process. Texturing is all about layers and how those layers are built up over time to tell a story. You can texture in Substance Painter if you've got access to it. It can be pretty pricey if you're not working for a studio that provides it. And I get that tools save you time and time is money, but if I know my audience, I know you'll appreciate if I share with you a cheaper workaround because I know a lot of you are doing indie production or freelancing. You're creating this on your own. You may not just be looking for a job within a big studio. So I'll be texturing within Blender. I think we can get some great results 
Do I think that Blender could use an updated texture painting workflow? Absolutely, but for what we're doing and our focus on indie production, I have a solution without costing us $100 a month. For that, let's support an indie creator, the developer of the add-on Fluent Materializer. It's a one-time purchase you can use every day and it's going towards a really cool dude. What this'll do is give us a few handy tools for both procedural and painted layer workflows in Blender. If you wanna follow along in Substance, that's cool. Just take the principles I teach and implement them there. Okay, now this is where we're gonna get a little bit more technical, but I encourage you to stick with me because I'm gonna change your texturing workflow, hopefully for the better. If nothing else, I'm gonna open your eyes to some new options. So as I mentioned before, we are gonna be using this really sweet add-on called Fluent Materializer. Once you have that installed, let's go ahead and split our window and go to our shader editor in one side. And we have this new tab here called Fluent. Also, in addition to that, if we press F, we have all of these new options within the Fluent Materializer add-on. And those are gonna be really important. Let's just talk about a few things. If we go into edit mode, you'll notice that we have extremely dense geometry. And we will optimize that down to a better, more manageable amount of vertices. But for now, I wanna show you uh, some really awesome procedural texturing techniques where we can get a base layer of textures on this guy. So you'll notice I'm leaving our other scanned reference up here just so we can quickly see some textures. If I think about the layers of the textures, because again, texturing is all about layers, I basically see three things. First, I see a base layer of wood texture. This is the raw kind of wood we're seeing. In addition to that, I see this other texture where things are a little bit lighter and I imagine this is where maybe things have been roughed up or some scratches have occurred and it's exposing some more raw wood underneath what is kind of sanded down and finished nicely. The third thing that we see is this painted on top of the wood where we have this paint that's a little bit more glossy maybe and definitely different colors. So. I'm gonna take this in three steps. We're gonna add each of those layers. The first two layers, the wood with the edge wear and the scratches, I'm gonna do all of that procedurally and then we'll bake it down to a more manageable uh, form of geometry with less vertices where we'll handle the texture painting of the actual color on top of it. So first things first, um, we have Fluent Materializer installed and let's go into rendered view. Instead of EV, I'm gonna be using cycles and I'll make sure that that's my GPU engine just so it's a little bit faster. And for the lighting environment, I'm just gonna come down and turn off scene world and that'll just drop down some, a look dev HDRI that'll give us just enough light to tell what's going on. So here is our principled uh, texture. We don't have anything going on except for a base color and it's a little bit less rough than usual. So to start off, let's add a wood texture. For that, I went to textures.com and I just grabbed this guy right here, if I could pull it up. This is just, uh, just basically a picture of some bark and I'm gonna drop that down as our initial texture. If I plug it in here, you'll notice we don't see any texture because this doesn't have UVs. And for now, I'm not gonna use UVs. I'm gonna hit Control T um, to bring up my mapping and texture coordinate nodes. You'll need to activate the Node Wrangler add-on that comes with Blender to be able to use these shortcuts. But once we do that, I'm gonna change it from UVs, since we don't have UVs, I'm gonna change it to object mapping. And that's just gonna map based on the object's positioning in the world. Instead of flat, I'm gonna change this to box. So it's projecting from um, all the different sides of a box. And then where there are harsh seams, you could see we could just blend those together, which is really nice. This is a little bit too low resolution for me, so I'm gonna up this to maybe five, just so we get more happening. Now this is my base layer of wood but this, these colors don't quite work for me, so I'm gonna drop down a color ramp node. And for the dark color, I'm gonna color pick kind of a darker area here, and the light color, I'll do the same on a lighter area here. And that's looking good, although I will bring the darks down a little bit just so there's more contrast. 
and I'll clamp down the lights just so we could see some of that wood grain that's happening there. So this is looking good for a very rough base layer. I'm gonna take this same image and go straight into the roughness and I'll drop down a color ramp node there as well. And if we isolate this by hitting control shift and then left clicking, we can see what that color ramp is doing to influence it. I'm gonna clamp down the whites. The, the lighter it is, the more rough it will be and the darker it is, the more glossy it will be. And now if we see uh, we have some variation there, although my darks are too dark, so I'm gonna bring those up so it doesn't dip down too glossy. And now I'm gonna save this. I've, sa I've done this a few times, so let's go texture. This is version three, and I'll save this. So this is looking okay. I may tweak it a little bit later, but as a base layer, this is looking decent. Now what we wanna do is we wanna start to bring in some random kind of um, roughed up wood and, and break this up. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work with the edges a little bit as if this has been worn out around the edges. So to do that, I'm gonna drop down a mix color node because we're mixing with the original color and something new. For that new texture, I'm bringing in a different texture, a different wood texture that looks like this. This is from textures.com as well. And this one, I'm gonna plug into the second input. And right now, it's just mixing kind of 50-50 in between those two options, which isn't really what we want. We want only to show this texture on the edges. So now we're jumping into Fluent for the first time. Press F and drop down a, an Edges node. Now we have a new mask that we can plug into the factor. And it's only showing us the second texture around the edges. Now. This isn't really what we want. We forgot to map this. We can use the same mapping node that we did earlier. And now we're actually mapping the second, second texture on top of that. If we isolate the edges node, we can see it's pretty big. So we can change this from 0 0.01 to maybe 0 0.005. And that's smaller. We can also play with the mask strength as well. We can also plug a texture in right here, which just randomly we can use this wood texture and that will use the the wood texture or the wood pattern to break up the edge mask. I actually don't want to use that. I'm going to press N to bring up my N panel, the right hand menu, and I'm going to go to grunge maps. Now this is under the fluent options and we have some awesome procedural grunge maps. I'm just going to grab one that looks nice and I'm going to plug the result into the texture. And now we're starting to break up that edge mask. I'm gonna play with the scale so it's a little bit larger or less frequent. And just until I find something that I think looks halfway decent. And now let's stop isolating that one region. And we can see we're starting to bring in some kind of um, roughed up areas around the edges. So it's all a matter of just playing around with different values and adding multiple layers to get what we want to work. So you'll end up with pretty much using the same technique over and over again. So let's do it again. Let's duplicate another mix node. And instead this time I'm gonna mix it with itself so nothing has changed. And then I'm gonna drop down a hue saturation value node in the second one. And for this one, I'm gonna lighten the value and turn down the saturation. And now if we drop down another edge mask here, we are deciding where things are gonna be lighter and less saturated. And we have kind of this procedural texturing workflow. So really it's just a matter of playing with values until you get things that you like. Now let's do the same technique, but let's do it for the cavities. So let's grab another mix node and let's plug this in twice. Hue saturation value, let's make it darker. So like 0.5 maybe, maybe even darker so it's obvious. And let's bring down the saturation a bit. Now let's go here, press F and drop down a cavity node. And you might hear my computer fans going a little crazy just because I've been rendering in real time. But if we drop down that mask, now we're starting to bring in some of the cavities, which is really cool. I don't want the saturation to be quite so desaturated and I don't want it to be quite as dark, but I do want to expand the distance a little bit. 
And again, my computer's gonna start whining, but hopefully you can still hear what I'm doing. I'm gonna take a moment now to just correct my overall hue saturation value. I'm gonna make it a bit more saturated, maybe not quite so much. I'm just looking at my reference here. And that's looking pretty good to me. So in addition to the cool edges and cavities that we have with this workflow, we also have some really cool procedural maps generated by Fluent. So I'm just doing one more um, kind of really broad map on the edges here where I'm gonna make things just kind of a dull, kind of lighter here around the edges. And I'm gonna make sure this is a pretty big distance. This, this map is gonna be much softer. So let's do a value 1.5. And I'm going back a step here and just getting rid of the extra saturation that I brought in. Um, you really have to think in terms of nodes here and it's, it's kind of difficult, but if you're ever in doubt of what something is doing, you can always push it to an extreme just so you can see exactly what effect it's having on your texture. So I'm trying to talk and think at the same time, so I'm not sure that I'm totally happy with the results that I'm getting, but I just wanted to show a few more things. So like I said, we have some really awesome procedural nodes here. I'm gonna just show one under grunges. If we come here to this grunge gradient, let's drop this. And let's do the same workflow where let's let's mix something, let's mix it with itself, let's drop down hue saturation value, and let's make it darker. And then let's drop down this gradient that we have here. And if we isolate what's happening here, you can see that this is a mask that's kind of creeping up around the bottom, and we can change where that's happening. So this is if there's been a lot of foot traffic, what I'm trying to simulate is it's getting kind of dirty towards the base of this object. And what's really cool is this is all procedural and we actually have no UV maps up to this point. We will get to a point where we'll add some maps, but this is kind of just playing around with some of these maps. So, and another one that I wanted to show you is we have some really cool procedural wood grains. If you come down to wood, and if it has this UV icon, it requires UVs, but we have some wood grains that don't require UVs. So let's go ahead and drop it down right here. And immediately we have some really cool wood grains. Uh, we're just gonna play around with some different, different noises that are happening. And we might play around with the scale a little bit just to make it less frequent and more, more noticeable. Um, we can also play with the distortion and there are just a lot of cool procedural um, techniques that we can implement. So again, this is kind of just a base layer just to get started on things. Uh, with this wood node, we can also come down and add a normal, and we can play with the normal strength. So if it was 0.5, that's a little bit too much for me. Let's go to like 0.2. And we can play with this for days. We also have some really cool imperfections, like some scratches that we could drop down, for example. Uh, so let's come here and I'm gonna mix these in. So let's drop down a mix color node. And I apologize, I'm going kind of fast, but I really just wanna show you as much as I can, as quickly as I can. So, oops, not a volume scatter. Let's do another hue saturation value. And where it's scratched, let's make it a little bit lighter and a little bit less saturated and now let's use the mask from the scratch imperfection and drive it into the value there. So we can play with a lot of different parameters here like increasing the scale of things so it's more frequent and then we can turn down the probability so there aren't scratches everywhere. We could also plug in an edge mask into the probability so that it's more probable that scratches happen where there are edges, which if you think about it, makes a lot of sense since these edges are kind of more exposed and might bump into things more. So I would play around with this a lot more before I call it good. But um, again, this is kind of just a demonstration of some of these procedural tools and you end up with something that looks really complex, but we're gonna bake it down into something extremely simple 
into a single set of PBR maps. And if you were to jump into any one of these node groups, you could see it is incredibly complex. The things um, that this developer has done to create this Fluent Materializer add-on, and that's why I love it so much, because it's taking extremely complex concepts and putting them in kind of a stream of consci consciousness node system that's easier to manage and easier to think about. So now that we have this base layer, this base texture, it's not perfect, but I'm gonna roll with it. Before we start painting on um, additional layers, we have to bake this down because if you look at this, if you go into edit mode, this has like 1.1 million faces, which is way too much for us to handle. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna duplicate this mesh and I'm gonna duplicate it one meter on the X axis, just so I know exactly where it is in 3D space. And with this new one, um, just so it's not distracting, I'm gonna get rid of our material. And I'm gonna come down to the object data properties, which you should be familiar with by now. We've been going to the remesh settings with a voxel remesher. And that's what I'm gonna do. Instead of a voxel size of 0.0008, I'm gonna set this to 0 0.01 and I'll remesh it. And that will immediately get rid of a lot of detail, but we wanna take it a little bit further than that. We want to go to the modifier settings and we're gonna add a decimate modifier. And if we set this to something like 0.15, that means for every one face that there was, there's now 0.15 faces. And I might set that to 0 0.2. I'm really just looking at the silhouette to see if there's enough detail around the silhouette of things. And let's go ahead and apply this. And now if we go to edit mode, you can see things are much more manageable from a geometry standpoint. And if we turn on our statistics, which are, let's see, over here, we could see that we went from 1.1 million faces to just over 2000, which is much more reasonable. So to bake all of this information onto this object, we need three things, and we already have two of them. The first thing we need over here is our high poly mesh. So I'm gonna name this totem underscore high. The second thing we need is low poly. So I'll rename this one totem underscore low. The third thing we need is optional, but can definitely help in the baking process. So I wanna show you. We can duplicate this again and move it over one meter. And this one is gonna be our cage mesh. So to create a cage mesh, let's go to edit mode, select everything and hit Alt S to scale along every face is normal. And that's kind of like inflating the mesh like a balloon. And this is the cage mesh. So this will be totem underscore cage. Now I said this is gonna be pretty technical, but again, this is really, really useful information for you to have on how to optimize and create a base texture for your objects before you start going into something like painting on texture detail. So to bake this, I am gonna use one additional add-on that's called Simple Bake. This is something that only costs $16 at the moment. It's definitely worth it. Worth it. it doesn't add any additional baking functionality to Blender but it does give you a nice interface that makes things a little bit easier to manage. So before we bake, I'm gonna clear the location of each of these objects so that they're all laying directly on top of each other. And I'm going to go to the render settings. And if you've installed the Simple Bake add-on, it'll appear here under a Simple Bake tab. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select my totem high poly object and I'm gonna come down here to bake objects and I'm going to add that as an object. Then I'm gonna select bake selected objects to target objects, which will take our high poly as the selected object and it will bake it to our target object, which is the low poly. So for target object, go ahead and select low poly. And then for the cage object, we can select our cage mesh. Now we just keep scrolling down to PBR bakes um, what maps do we want? What information do we want to pull from the high poly mesh? So we definitely want to pull the diffuse data that we created with that procedural setup. Let's go ahead and pull over the normal data as well. You can do that as an OpenGL or a DirectX map. Blender uses OpenGL. Something like Unreal Engine will use DirectX. 
Um, I want to bring over roughness. You can choose whether it's roughness or glossy workflow. We'll stick to roughness since that's what Blender uses. And keep going down. You could add some special bakes like um, thickness maps or curvature maps, but since we already did that procedural setup, we won't worry about that. We'll go to our texture settings. I'm going to bake at a resolution of 5K, but I'm going to output as a at a resolution of 4K. And the reason for that downscaling is I just get a little bit more texture detail in there, which is really nice. For the export settings, I'm gonna export my bakes and I'm just gonna quickly choose a folder location where those will um, export out to. I've already created it here and you can see I've done this a few times already, but I'll create a new folder and this is where our maps will export to. And after that, you just click bake to target and it says there's no UVs because I forgot and I'm glad that I forgot so I can show you. So go to the low poly mesh and in edit mode, um, if we change this to our UV editor, you can see that we have no UVs. It's really quick. Let's just hit U and let's do a smart UV project. That will just generate some automatic UVs. Now we can go ahead and click bake and it will start to bake in the foreground. If you still want to work in your scene, you can bake in the background, but I recommend baking in the foreground just so you don't bog down your computer with too many tasks at one time. So now we can see the progress down here. It's not gonna go quite as fast as something like Substance Painter or Marmoset Tool Bag, but it is still pretty quick. So I'll just give it one minute for it to complete baking those maps. Okay, our first map is already done and you could see it in our image editor over here. And as you could see, it's bringing in all of the data that we brought in procedurally without UVs when we just used some of the Fluent Materializer nodes that we get for free. So this is really, really awesome. And next it's gonna be working on the normal bake. Um, once that comes up very quickly, we can see if there's been any issues and if we need to adjust the scale of our cage mesh. So I'm gonna give it one more second to complete the normal and then we'll take a look at that. Okay, it looks like that's done. And from a glance, things look pretty clean. It exported all of our maps to the folder location that we predetermined. And things look good, but just to be sure, let's go ahead and apply these maps to the mesh. So I'm just gonna copy where those maps are. I'm gonna hide our high poly and I'm gonna hide our cage mesh. So all that we're looking at is the low poly. And now let's come over here to our shader editor and let's create a new shader. And instead of that whole complex shader setup, all we're gonna do now is plug in three maps. So hit Control Shift T to identify um, three maps within the PBR workflow. We're gonna grab those three maps. These are the texture bakes that were exported and click principled texture setup and it will automatically set it up. And as you can see, it looks exactly like it did with our whole complex procedural texture workflow. But now we have an extremely optimized mesh and we only have three image textures going in. So this is, this is pretty much ready to go into a game or into VR. The only thing that we're missing is we're missing the actual painting of the different colors on top of everything. So that's what I'm gonna show you how to do now. So let me just grab my uh, tablet real quick, move my keyboard out of the way, and let me show you what we're doing. So right now, let me go back to object mode here. Right now we have our totem pole and we're just in material preview mode right now so we can see what we're doing. I'm gonna utilize a cool functionality in Fluent Materializer that gives us the ob ability to quickly add a new painted mask. And what we're gonna do is similar to like a screen printing approach where we're going to slowly build up the different colors in this model. So starting with a teal painted material, let's go ahead and take this principled BSDF node and we're gonna add a new one. So let's just type in principled and we'll plug it in here so we could see what we're doing. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna grab this kind of teal color and I'm gonna saturate that a little bit more and play with the hue and the lightness a little bit. So here we have a good teal color. 
I'm going to borrow the normal map that we had from the wood and I'm going to plug it in here so that we have the same normal information and I think I'll, I'll also borrow the roughness map although I'm going to drop down a uh, hue saturation value node and interrupt that channel for the roughness map because I want it to be a little bit more glossy so I'm going to lower the value say to like 0.5 so this is our teal paint material and what we could do is um, we can hit control H on a node any node really and what that will do is it will hide anything that's not in use so that just makes it a little bit easier for us to see what we're doing here now I'm going to drop in a mix shader and this is similar to mixing different layers in substance painter or any other layer based program but instead we're using a node workflow so this again is just mixing straight between the two uh, instead of that we want to drop down a factor and drive it with a painted factor and so the way that we can do that is if we hit F when we have fluent enabled that add-on and we drop down a paint and once we do that it'll add this little guy in here and it'll actually isolate that um, to start with but we don't want to isolate that we just want to view the output and then we could plug this mask into the factor so now everything is completely black there's nothing on the mask but um, we are able to paint white so if I come here um, F can control the size of our brush and then let's see shift F can that's the angle sorry confusion there here's the fall off and that seems to be affecting it well so um, we have some presets here this is just a completely hard brush and by default there's a little bit of a fall off um, a smooth fall off so that works for me and as you could see we are painting on let's let's uh, navigate here so we can get up close we're painting on this teal paint layer and whatever we do to that that uh, second principle BSTF texture is what is going to appear here so we could actually affect all sorts of different things and the cool thing about this is not only can we come on here and and just paint um, straight on there but after the fact we can come over here and we can drop a texture into this painted mask so if we bring back up the fluent materializer options and we bring in a procedural grunge map we could plug that result into the texture and now it'll take just a second because it has quite a bit to think about but we can start to affect uh, how that that layer is distributed we could also um, nothing says we have to keep everything procedural we could run to textures.com and we could just grab like a, a grunge map and let me just find one that looks good I'm gonna grab a random one here dirty paint sounds good We'll grab 4K. I'll just throw out my downloads for now. And once we get that, we can drop that down straight into the texture. And now that dirty paint texture is going to drive um, our painted texture, which is really cool. So we can continue to, to paint here. If we go back to, uh, let's see, texture paint mode, and we could just continue to add on more and it will automatically be using that texture so like I said this is kind of like a screen screen printing process so what I would do is I would go through everywhere that I plan to have this this teal texture and I would add it um, across the board and then I would move on to the next layer which could be the red paint or the blue paint or the green paint or the black paint you get the idea so what I'll do is I'll paint everywhere where I want this secondary texture and then I'll move on to the next one so again you have this really cool functionality where you can control um, different masks on how it's distributed and it actually feels pretty organic 
with just that one uh, chipped or dirty paint texture I added, it feels like uh, this paint as I'm painting is not completely going on, but is, is interrupted by the roughness of, of the wood textures. So hopefully you get the idea and you could see how adding these up over time could result in a really cool look as you mix and match different textures and you can use the uh, influences from your previous node setup, what you used, your history rather, like how we use this normal map and we had it influence our next texture. So if we were to move on and add the next one, we would just drop down another mix shader and then we would have our additional principal BSDF go in here and then we would hit F and we would add a new paint layer and that new paint layer would drive the next step in the node process. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna get busy painting and adding each layer that I need and I'll check back in with you when I've managed to get some good progress and get to somewhere I'm happy with. Oh, and one more thing before I get too far, I wanted to show you another thing here. So back to our, our mix shader here, we can take actually a ramp, a color ramp node here, and if we take a peek at what this looks like, we could see our painted uh, material is basically saying, hey, where it's black, show the wood, where it's white, show the teal, but what if we wanted it to be kind of teal with the wood peeking in through the back, almost like playing with the opacity? Well, we could change where it's white, and we could say, instead of being white, be darker. So bring in back some of that wood texture, and if we look at the result, we could see what that's doing. So again, you kind of have to shift your mentality from more of a layer-based painting program, and you need to shift it into more of this node-based workflow. It's, it's just as powerful as the layer-based. In my opinion, it's more powerful, but it may take some practicing and it may take a shift in your mind to be able to get to a point where you're comfortable working with this. So now I'm gonna jump forward to the final textured setup we'll, where we'll do one more quick bake and our asset will be completely ready to go. Hey, quick interruption, so I've been texturing the last 30 minutes or so, and I've got to a point where things were starting to slow down because I had so many different layers, so I wanted to show you what I did. It was pretty easy. I just came back over to the Simple Bake options, and I added our totem low poly object, and from there, I deselected bake selected objects to target objects because we're not baking from high to low anymore. We're just baking to the object. And then I wanted diffuse roughness and normal. I still did 5K baking down to 2K, so I didn't touch anything there. And then I just selected a new output and baked it. And this was the result. As you can see here with these maps, I have the new base color, normal, and roughness, taking into account all of the changes we made to the materials. So if you get to a point where you need to quickly kind of check in and do a bake so that things move a little bit faster. You can do that. And now I'm just going to assign the new principled um, shader. And on that principled shader, let's plug in those maps that I just barely baked out. These three. And just like that, we are back to just using three maps instead of um, tons of different paint layers that we were using. So now that we have this, I really should have deleted everything else before I added this. But now, let's see, get these out of the way. Now all of this could be deleted or we could just kind of leave it over here 
as a backup just in case something happens to these maps. If it's not plugged into the output, it's not calculating it, so it's not gonna slow our scene down at all. It can kind of just be a non-destructive thing sitting over here. So from here, we can continue the painting workflow because I haven't finished yet. I'm gonna add the dark blue, the dark green, and this maroon color down here as well as the base. So I will check in again after I've managed to touch up some of those areas. Hey, congrats on making it to the end. This is our final result. We have detailed textures, it's optimized geometry, and everything was done within Blender. If you learned a thing or two, please consider subscribing. This is actually my first week out on my own. I quit my job last week. If you follow me on Twitter, you might have seen that. But I'm really excited just to spend more time creating tutorials and assets and just trying to create value for my awesome community. So please consider subscribing. Um, every YouTuber says that, but honestly, it helps a lot. So, uh, And let me know what you want to see in the next video. I plan on just doing more asset creation. I imagine it'll take a few attempts at this before the concepts start to sink in. And rather than watching the same video over and over again, I like to show different assets because each asset has kind of a unique challenge and showcases new techniques. So um, again, subscribe. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video, I guess.